I'm thinking now of Ma uh, Mary Anderson, the head of the yeah. Women's Bureau, who mm -hmm. wrote, I think in 1926, a rather well-known article in which she declared, I'm a feminist, but in yeah. so many words, you know, yeah. I consider myself a feminist, yeah. she said, but I'm a practical feminist. Right. And historians have come to call people like Mary Anderson social feminists right. because they cared about the social right. issues. Right. And I, I, I think one of the things to note is that what you describe as a split was really a bitter, bitter oh, yes. argument. I mean, I don't, it's, you know, split seems not oh, it's too quite. <laughs> well, I agree with you there. I completely agree. Part of that had to do with an original uh, uh, real difference in opinion and anger on both sides during the suffrage campaign, which was about methods mm. and stratagems in that when the National Women's Party did radical things such as parading Wilson's image and lambasting him or chaining themselves to the White House, publicity getting techniques, this tremendously angered the majority wing in the women's suffrage movement led by Carrie Chapman Catt, who were proceeding very methodically to lobby Congress, to be respectable, to do war work on behalf of American involvement in World War I, and do all the things that they thought were appropriate, respectable, would gain the support of men in Congress and the president for the women's suffrage cause. And they saw everything the militants did as battering down the door and creating a bad name for the suffrage cause. So there was bitterness between those groups in the late 19-teens, after 1915. Mm. That carried over into the bitterness of the division over the Equal Rights Amendment versus the social feminist, if you want to call it that, wing. Uh, but then it was added to because the National Women's Party was seen as just so pig-headed about it. Uh, and the women who were pursuing what they saw as a reasonable reform agenda were always having these people arguing against them. Mm. Uh, so it, it was a it was a longstanding bitterness, a lot of rancor. That really, it wasn't until the late 30s that certain women tried to find a middle way. But even though Mary right. Anderson called herself a practical feminist, she didn't typically use the word feminist, and it was. Mm. It, in my awareness of this situation, it was much more common for women on the side of protective labor legislation just to avoid the word just altogether. Just to avoid the word. And it was really historians so, who made up that term social feminist. I, I was very drawn to a point that Bell Hooks made in one of her books around this question of, well, what do we label feminist? You know, which group are they feminist? Is this person a feminist or not? And she said the important thing is, does it contribute to feminist movement? Meaning that this is a kind of progression that we later can say this, or, or disagree or agree that the kinds of benefits that were put in for women workers were contributing to feminist movement, you know, advancement for women more generally, more ability for them to work favorably in wage earning and have families too. That's more of a question than that the label feminist Right. Be placed or not placed. Of I, course, people don't agree about that either. Not that a, is, not at all. some people argue that protective labor legislation, for example, benefited women, right. and other people, right. like yours truly, argue yeah. that it also had very yeah. clear disadvantages. Yeah, the truth for, is, it did both. It right. both benefited exactly. and disadvantaged, and it depended where a woman was in the labor force. And I, my own feeling is that the point at which the uh, those four protective labor legislation were behind the eight ball was once there was protective labor legislation for both sexes and that why they continued to hang on to wanting a differentiation between say the mid 40s and 1960s that i i don't i can't quite understand that at the it seems like at that point i don't know whether an equal rights amendment should have been passed but Overall, I find the reluctance to pass an equal rights amendment in this country a really interesting sign, and it, in my mind, it is of a piece with the failure to pass a child labor amendment in the 1920s, which again links 
our, our own period within it. That is, it's as though the American people does not accept an amendment that affects what goes on in the family. Mm. That this is a realm that still inhabits something like the private. It, it, it's haunted by this ghost of the control of the male citizen of yeah. the household. I uh, think you're right about that. And there are those who argue that once the male breadwinner ideology begins to dissipate, that at that moment, the ERA can be supported by large mm -hmm. numbers of people. Mm -hmm. Because it's precisely at that moment that one is sort of giving up the notion that the male alone yeah. supports the family, which yeah. is consistent with yeah. you. Yeah. I mean, I think this, this notion is, is still there. Its ghostly presence is still there, although the laws, in, in fact, are quite equalitarian yes. about spouses now. Well, they still support the bond in the household and the mutual necessity, legal necessity, for spouses to support one another. Uh, they're not gender prescribed or right. gender specific. Uh, let me just ask you one more question yeah. to see if we can pull this together a little bit. So as I understand what you're saying, if I look at feminism as it was used in the 1930s mm -hmm. and compare it to feminism as it was used in 1910 or 1912, its definition is narrower in some ways than it was in those early years. I think absolutely, yes, yes. I think in the 19 teens, it's a, it's a newborn term. It has a lot of flexibility, and it's seen as much broader than the vote. Uh, but because of the Equal Rights Amendment and the fracas over it, it becomes used to describe only the National Women's Party approach to things and an equal rights, a legal equal rights mm. approach, at least as we can trace it in the records. I, it's hard to know whether women applied it to themselves mm. privately, uh, but yes. And this is a trick question, yeah. but <laughs> when it reemerges in the yeah. 1970s, it, does, it, does it now have a new breadth to it, yeah. or is it? Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure that everyone who's researched this period would agree with me, but it does seem to me that in the year 1970, when the term began to be used much more broadly, it had been used by a couple of New York groups, the Radical Feminists, the New York Feminists, or the Feminist Party There was a, in the very late 60s. But of course, there was a larger group that called themselves roughly Women's Liberation, yeah, it? Right. and there was the National Organization for Women that loosely used the term feminism, but on feminist, but it didn't. It wasn't in the name. No. So we had these two women's names, which themselves were still a carryover from the avoidance of the term feminist. And I think in 1970, there was a juncture. There was the big Women's Equality Day march on August 26th, the 50th anniversary of the vote. And the term feminist was used there. And I see it as being used as a term of unity mm. between the women in now and women's liberation women who had come together for this event, the women's strike uh, of that day. And then it became, began to be used sort of more generally, the feminist this and that. And it seemed to have malleability. It had lost the problems it bore between the 20s and the 60s, it seems to me. Mm. Later, it, I mean, there, there was a split in the new left between the so-called politicos and the radical feminists, but that was the late 60s. And by 70 and after, right. that particular conflict was not going on. There were many adjectives that were applied to feminists to, express people's differences, cultural feminist, radical feminist, socialist feminist, etc. But the term feminist was a pretty broad-ranging broad term, term again. Right. And then the next split, I yes, suppose, right. is generational. Yes, you know, with the 80s and 90s. Right, right. right. And now we see in the 2010s, Beyonce is announcing herself as a feminist, mm -hmm. and other media stars are announcing themselves as feminists. So it's in the magazines again as a kind of broad, undefinable term for any woman who asserts herself. <laughs>